Welcome to Thrive Talks, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, the not-for-profit tech and research forum. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, I'm pleased to welcome Joanne Wosden. Joanne works as a naturalist for the Bear Creek Nature Centre. She was introduced to the world of wildlife as an adult through conservation education. She's worked as both a scientist and a science teacher and aims to be a bridge between the two. Whether art and media or moss and mammal research, she hopes to bring her wide array of skills to excite the community about native wildlife opportunities. (laughs) Welcome, Joanne, and thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Of course. Now, you work as a naturalist. What does that entail? It's something that a lot of people ask me, well, what is that? It's not actually very intuitive. And depending on who I ask, there are some other words that might be more helpful at saying what a naturalist is. So sometimes I tell people I'm a biologist who works at an education center. And in a way, that's kind of what many naturalists do. They both work with wildlife. So in some ways, they're like a zookeeper, where they might be doing hands-on work with wildlife. They're a teacher. They often do education events with everyone from children to the elderly, uh, depending on the demographics of who's coming for whatever event. And then they also often work with wildlife professionals, whether that's government or city agencies, doing work on maybe their property or doing work with the animals that are in their care. So I do a little bit of all of that. So biologist, teacher, zookeeper, all swirled into one. Okay. So that sounds like a really fun occupation. You get to like engage different skills and things like that. Yes. But there is a lot of cleaning up that has to happen. So that's the thing. It's fun, but it's also a lot of cleaning, a lot of dishes. Yeah, I I suppose. And Probably like working with animals, a lot of poop as well. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Lots of poop. I didn't know if I could say poop, you know. I don't know what I'm doing. (laughs) (laughs) No, you're you're fine. (laughs) Okay, so what are some things about environmental protection that people might not be aware of? It's interesting that you invited me to this podcast at this time because I had been kind of thinking about certain things. There's a lot of community-based conservation efforts happening in our area. And so there's just been a lot of discussion lately about policies and how to be sustainable and how to do that, like as from the city level or the state level or even the national level. I think that what's happening right now in the world of conservation is that we're kind of transitioning from a phase of getting people to want to be sustainable and want to make change and want to be, you know, environmentally friendly or going green. I think that was kind of the last several decades had a real big push to going green. So now everyone's green and wants to be green. But I think right now we're in the transition stage of what does that actually mean and how to translate that then to the different, we might say policies or even just the things that people might do in their neighborhood associations. I think that's just as impactful to wildlife and to nature. Um, Even though that's like a small policy, it might just be 50 homes or something, depending on how many people are living in your neighborhood. But people want to be green. They want to be sustainable. But now I think it's a matter of educating and allowing people to see what that nature is supposed to look like now that you want to save it. Yeah, that's a, a good point because a lot of people, they, they want to, to help the environment, but they don't know exactly how. And so there's also, I think, a lot mm-hmm. of like corporate greenwashing that happens. So mm-hmm. people, you know, think they're being sustainable. They go, oh, yeah. this has got a green label on it. So it must be perfect, but it's yes. not actually sustainable. Do you think that there's uh, different levels of policy or, or ways that groups should be engaging with sustainability in order to look after the area, the environment specific to where they are. Yes. I I actually love that you brought that up. Um, The idea that not every area has the same set of rules, right? So if you live in the United States, it's kind of historic grassland. It's going to look a lot differently than where I am at, which is more of a forested kind of rocky region. And so it just, depends on where you are. And I think you're right. That's that what has kind of happened with a lot of our green labeling, a lot of our, in some ways good, but in some ways simplistic messaging about how to help the environment. It's become kind of a one size fits all. Um, And so, you know, we hear a lot about like save the trees and plant a tree, which is great. 
if you live in somewhere where there needs to be trees. If you're in a desert, that doesn't really help so much. Um, and there's other examples of times when those kinds of messaging can actually be damaging to an ecosystem because it makes people think that they're doing good but actually harming it. Right. Um, and really, I think there's been a lot of move towards kind of human dimensions of wildlife. And we've kind of transitioned in conservation less from thinking about spaces as being separate, but how can humans coexist with those wild spaces? And so one of my favorite areas that I'm kind of dabbling in right now um, as kind of an early career conservationist is community-based conservation. It's really just this idea that the best and most impactful conservation efforts and sustainability efforts are not going to come from, you know, your big nonprofit, and they might still be nonprofit, and they do a lot of good, and they do great work, but a lot of that boots on the ground habitat restoration work really is going to come from communities making intentional decisions to come together. This often involves different areas. Sometimes it's schools, so education, getting involved with maybe politics, right? So maybe getting involved with some local city work, going to those zoning meetings is tiresome and no one wants to do it. But that's where a lot of those conversations start when people are worried about urbanization. For example, that's something that's big in our area. I am just outside of the Atlanta metro. And so I live in a rural area that's rapidly urbanizing. And so there's that shift. And so there's a lot of people interested in, well, how do we maintain this? How do we keep this for a legacy for our kids? How do we do this? And those are the kinds of conversations that get started and they kind of build on each other. So schools get involved, um, cities can get involved. You start getting uh, nonprofits like mine as an education, uh, an environmental education center. We get involved with this um, and there's other nonprofits and different people who have different skills and abilities to kind of make these sorts of efforts happen. But it's starting to be a more collaborative model of how this work happens. I think in the past I think some people thought you kind of had to be a really committed uh, biologist or just a really committed someone out of college, right? You get to go be a part of the maybe the Peace Corps and just go to another country and just dedicate your whole life to living with, I don't know, some rare bird in a, in a tropical <laughs> forest. And we have these ideas of these kind of maybe fancy ways to be a biologist. And I'm not shaking anyone who wants to do that. It's really exciting if you want to be that biologist who's like in some unknown forest discovering some unknown frogs. Super cool. But I do think it's equally as important to have some of those homegrown efforts uh, where it's just maybe people in your own hometown coming together and recognizing the value of what you have and then wanting to make sure that it's not only maintained, but restored to what its full potential is. Yeah, I suppose that's a a really good point. Like instead of trying to you know, transform everybody into the the super (laughs) green people who are going out and living with wildlife. Mm -hmm. It's more about going, how about we incorporate some of that environmentalism into our everyday lives so that you can still be a regular person and you don't have to Mm -hmm. (laughs) completely transform. Um, So, yeah, that's obviously going to be a huge thing. What um, you you mentioned a little bit about certain organizations. What do you think about the way that we do tend to prioritize saving cute endangered animals like pandas, for example? Are there like important or interesting species that you think get overlooked due to that? Well, if you, uh, (laughs) if my husband was here to ask that, he'd be like, oh boy, are you in for an essay? (laughs) I'm very passionate about this topic. The animal, I would say, a lot of people have their own stories of what made them want to go be a biologist and what made them want to go study wildlife. I had never been interested in science at all in my life. I wasn't really into, I wasn't really academic when I was in school. It was when I was an adult and I started volunteering at a nature center when I met a gopher tortoise, which is not the cutest animal in the world. It's actually quite kind of creepy looking. It's very old and grumbly (laughs) and wrinkly like every tortoise is. And he was also deformed, which is why he was not in the wild. And so he was um, a a weird looking creature that not many people get a close up interaction with. But I absolutely fell in love. And I was like, this is such a strange, unique creature. I want to learn more about these guys. So I'm a little partial to maybe those less charismatic species uh, that we might call them. But I think that there is such value in not just showing people what is aesthetically pleasing to them. Um, But what is really aesthetically functional (laughs) for nature? Uh, I think that's really the next step. Like I alluded to earlier, I think right now we're in a phase of everyone wants to plant a tree. And that's great. 
But sometimes if you plant a tree, if it's non-native, it's not supposed to be there, you plant it in a bunch of rows, you're monoculturing it, or it's in a, an environment that it shouldn't be in, it doesn't matter how pretty that tree looks and it doesn't matter how many trees you put there. Uh, it's a dead zone for wildlife and your pollinators aren't going to go towards it, your animals aren't going to want to live near it, and it's going to be taking up those nutrients from the soil and using up resources that your native plants and animals need. And so while... I think we've gotten one part of the messaging right, which is certainly that we should want to make a difference. I think there's a lot of not only animals, but even entire habitats that just don't look aesthetically pleasing to us. And so I think we've misunderstood them for a long time. And in service of planting more trees, we've been eliminating a lot of these uglier, we could say, habitats. Just a few that come to mind are, are grasslands. Um, they look like a bunch of weeds in the winter. They're just wild. Wildflowers don't always look flowered. Um, they don't always look pretty. And so a lot of times people think it's a dead zone, but it's actually one of the most important habitats, especially in the United States. Um, about 99% of our historic grasslands are gone. Wow. So it's a nearly extinct ecosystem due to various reasons, you know, partly farming, partly urbanization, but a lot of it has also just been, we've been allowing them to disappear just by turning them into forests. And so there's just a lot of uh, missed potential, a lot of birds that no longer live there, a lot of pollinators that are no longer there also that need that grassland to sustain them. Uh, wetlands are also another thing that often get filled in. It's actually, uh, there's, a, there's a meme from the show Arrested Development, I think of, uh, where Lindsay Bluth uh, just is joking about going to a wetland conservation fund fundraiser and she thinks that they're filling in the wetlands and it's this joke it's a whole joke that's played in this sitcom but people actually fill in wetlands like it's not even a joke people actually do it and don't realize um, that that's what's happening because to us they just kind of look like wastelands um, especially if it's not a pretty waste uh, a pretty wetland with maybe you know we might see like the picturesque pictures of like cranes and the water flowing it doesn't always look like that there's some wetlands that look like it's just wet trees and the trees kind of look dead and scraggly because they don't grow as much foliage and to us that looks like oh well we'll just fill it in and make it something prettier um but there's so much diversity there there's so much beautiful uh, things and a lot of those things people just don't see and so i think it's easy to write it off where i grew up my school was right next to a wetlands and we had a mm -hmm. whole conservation center and a lot of our education actually um focused on bringing us to the wetlands and teaching us about it and i i do understand that you've also worked as a teacher so what what's are some of the benefits that you see from teaching kids about that nature and, and environmental protection i think one of the basic things just like we were saying is kids have yet to form their ideas of what they find beautiful. I think there's a lot of value in sharing with them the beauty of function. And often, I mean, we learn our tastes from other people, right? There's a reason why yeah. every kid wants what that other kid is wearing because it becomes popular because someone else is doing it. And I think as teachers, uh, sometimes you just have to be the first one to show them something that they might not have thought it was cool. And then all of a sudden they think it's really cool. I actually did that with my students. Uh, it was the 2020 year, the dreaded 2020 year. And I loved teaching them about fire ecology. And it's something that a lot of people don't know about, that a lot of places in both uh, the Americas and in Australia have historically needed fire to actually maintain the landscape. And as people kind of moved in and stopped allowing natural fires to happen, a lot of these wildflowers, a lot of these savannas, a lot of these forests just kind of stopped uh, developing and a lot of them are actually endangered or extinct depending on where in the world uh, they are. And so I spent so much time teaching my kids about all these strange animals and how fire actually helps them and how they need fire to live and all these grasses and these um, different areas. Uh, we, we learned about indigo snakes. They're, they're one of my favorite snakes. They look like rainbows when they're in the sun. Um, we looked at the gopher tortoise. We looked at all these different things and they don't know about this stuff even though it's like right in their state, even though some of them, some of these animals might be in their backyard. That age, especially, I, I love middle school, especially, but, um, but students are just open to absorb more. Uh, and many times they're easier to talk to than adults because <laughs> adults already have their opinions on everything. And so I think with kids, it's great because they're able to learn things in a new way and they're much more open to thinking about things that maybe we didn't think of ourselves. I remember as a kid, 
I used to have pet snails that I would just like <laughs> play with and like put it, they'd crawl on my hands and stuff. And like now I probably wouldn't do that because I'd, you know, go, ew, gross snails. But yeah, as a kid, I was like, <laughs> they're cute. <laughs> so yeah. they're so bold about it too. I had a student and I would always get an email in my teacher email uh, just about whatever weird animal she was really into. And she, I mean, she was a girly girl. I mean, she loved like pink and just sparkles and just everything. But then she would send me, Mrs. Wasden, did you know about the eye eye? Or did you know about the proboscis monkey? And these are strange animals. You know, they don't look very aesthetically pleasing if we're talking about cute animals. These are not necessarily cute. They're kind of scary, but she just loved them. And, and I think I just love that kind of juxtaposition that other people might see her and think one thing about her, about her tastes and what she appreciated. But she had her own style when it came to the kinds of wildlife that she enjoyed and she loved sharing about it. Do you have a, a favorite species of animal yourself? Is that the, the tortoise or? If you ask my husband, he'd probably say it changes every month. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> I always, there's always something new to me. Um, there's always just something new that I'm, I'm really excited about. In general, I kind of almost always fall back to, to reptiles and amphibians. Um, and so I could be happy uh, just doing stuff with amphibians and reptiles, but I've really found my niche in in kind of broader conservation focus and really looking at habitats. And I love just seeing really the interactions between all of them. And so I have some favorite habitats. Like I love the longleaf pine forest because I love all of those animals that are in there. Um, and I love uh, looking at the Appalachian mountains and just learning about all the different types of salamanders that are there. And I love looking at wetlands and streams because I like the different fish or the different birds that are there. So it just, it changes every month. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll say I'll say herps. I'll I'll put myself into team herp because I know that like on Twitter there's always like, you know, team bird, team fish, team herp. I guess I'll be team herp, but I'm a close second team fish. <laughs> so yeah. definitely more in the more interesting looking animals than the the traditional. <laughs> so, I guess I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> but that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, have you had any sort of scary experiences while working with wildlife? I've never been bitten yet, so <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> I haven't been bitten yet, and I know a lot of people say it's like a rite of passage, but it just hasn't happened to me yet. Um, I also really, really love fish, but I hadn't even learned how to swim until like maybe like five years ago, so I didn't learn to swim wow. until I was an adult. So I guess that was kind of scary in the sense that like I was starting to kind of you know go into deep water, and that was a little frightening for me, like learning about fish. But I was just so wanting to learn about fish that I was like, I'm just going to conquer this. I'm going to learn how to swim so that in case I fall out of the boat, I'll be fine. Have you ever gone um, like um, snorkeling or anything to? I've I've never done that. I mostly dabble with freshwater fish, and I love freshwater fish. I'm I'm still a little like I'm working my way from smaller bodies of water towards larger. Right. So, Someone would really have to convince me towards um, yeah. ocean sampling, but we'll get there maybe. <laughs> but uh, I've, I've really never had, I don't think, any scary experiences. So when I was first learning how to handle a lot of our reptiles, again, I was an adult. I, I never really thought about uh, being in wildlife or anything, but as I was learning, one thing I really learned with that set of animals is reptiles are actually very predictable. <laughs> You, the way you approach them, they're going to approach you. If you're calm, they're calm. If you're kind of timid, they're going to be timid. If you're scared, they're scared. If you're jumpy, they're definitely going to be jumpy. So I find that reptiles are actually very predictable and some of the scariest animals are actually really some of, I think, the easiest to work with. So for example, we've got a boa constrictor currently um, who was rescued through the Georgia Reptile Society. Um, and they take in like maybe abandoned pets or animals that they maybe have found that are non-native. And, and so we have a few boa constrictors and they can be scary to people because they're very they're large snakes. Um, and boa constrictors are kind of that stereotypical snake that people fear is going to eat them in their sleep. Uh, but they won't. <laughs> uh, n not least because they don't live here. <laughs> But one of the things that you, I've just been doing is really just been calmly spending time with our bow constrictor. He likes baths, so I like to spray him with water and that gets him excited to be pet and it just gets him comfortable with my voice and my hand and my, um, you know, the things that mean I'm not eating. Um, and so really, it's, it's really just the kinds of positioning that you give to them. So the signals that you send to them, they're very receptive to it. And uh, incidentally, I often tell people that it's actually mammals who are a little bit more unpredictable. They kind of have their own brains. So squirrels are actually the scariest thing. Really? I think I've worked with. 
That's, that might be the plot twist of my I haven't met any like super large animals. I mean, I think I encountered a bear once in the Smokies. Okay. Um, you, kinda, you, know, you just kind of turn around and just walk away. <laughs> but uh, yeah, squirrels. Squirrels are frightening. It's, it's actually funny that you mentioned like bears because there's like a bit of a meme about Australia being mm-hmm. host to like horrible wildlife. Oh, the, and, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, like, well, I get that. So I, I actually grew up in the Sonoran Desert, so I grew up in southern uh, Arizona. So I grew up in a desert, which obviously is different than Australia, but there's a lot of the similar types of animals in kind of an arid region. And so everyone will always be like, what was it like living there? And honestly, you don't notice most of the stuff. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And, and what you said about it, how you approach things, like, you know, you just – hey, if there's a snake, maybe don't go near it, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. How big of an issue is wildlife trafficking and people wanting to have exotic pets? I mean, that's been kind of the perennial problem since, you know, the world started getting smaller with the Columbian Exchange, right? So once we started sailing around um, and learning of each other's existence, of course, inevitably, we're going to be bringing plants and animals it's a complicated situation. I'm not as familiar with a lot of the policies going on right now, but there is certainly at least one large uh, newsworthy item. I know that the Lacey Act is going through. What is that? Making waves in the United States. Um, it's just, it, it's an act that has already existed in the United States that regulated a lot of trade and movement of exotic animals between states. And they're revising it um, or submitting some revisions. Um that have a lot of people concerned just because, I mean, they're just extreme measures. And it's it's difficult to comment because on one hand, as a, a you know, as someone in wildlife, it's like you kind of understand where the people who are going really hard um, are coming from, right? Because yeah. there are issues with people not knowing or even, we could say, sustainably sourcing their exotic pets, right? So it's like... You know, a lot of, for example, if you're about to get a Russian tortoise, I have a Russian tortoise in here, actually, he's sleeping right now. But if you get a Russian tortoise from one of the big box chains, that Russian tortoise is probably from the wild. And so I don't think a lot of people realize that still happens with pet stores right now, that they're not just getting them from a breeder down the street. Um, A lot of times these are coming through less than normal means that we would maybe think of it as the consumer and you know and that goes for plenty of other animals as well there are legitimate breeders and so i don't want to step i don't want the herp enthusiasts to come at me because i certainly respect them as well but uh, again it's kind of like a balance like you kind of understand the people that really want to go hard on regulations and you also understand the people that will you know want to enjoy these animals as pets and i think there can be sometimes more prejudice towards again, those uglier looking things. So there can oftentimes be regulations that are more prejudiced towards uh, reptiles and amphibians than there are to mammals that are maybe even equally or more (laughs) um, impactful to native wildlife. So um, it's a complicated issue and I'm not going to suggest that I'm the person to talk about with that, (laughs) but there's just a lot of that kind of in the air right now. (laughs) Yep. That's fair. Like people, you know, will go, oh, yeah, obviously you shouldn't be bringing the, these reptiles or whatever in, but then they won't look at things like um, in Australia. We have a massive issue with imported animals because we were so segregated mm-hmm. from the rest of the world and cats are one of the biggest problems mm-hmm. because they absolutely destroy, they demolish our native wildlife. Mm-hmm. And here in Queensland where I am, we've also we, we brought in cane toads and to, to help eat bugs for crops and they went well we could eat everything else and just Mm -hmm. went wild so yeah that's that's obviously it's a huge issue that yeah people need to be I suppose considerate of and when you are sourcing you know if if you want a pet that is exotic maybe yeah just being really careful about where you're getting it from rather than Mm -hmm. I would say that is probably one of the biggest issues, especially if we're thinking about the Russian tortoise. That's obviously near and dear to my heart as I like tortoises, but um, there's certainly a lot of other animals as well. But especially certain reptiles and birds um, tend to be some that are still sourced in strange ways that I think are technically legal, but a little bit sus maybe, as they maybe say. shouldn't be as legal like you <laughs> yeah. know yeah yeah with like ecosystems and, and animals and things like that generally no one likes mosquitoes 
because they spread <laughs> disease and things like that. You know, they're not, they're not a real popular insect. And so there's actually been a lot of resources devoted to trying to wipe them out. If we succeed, what kind of impact would we see? So there are some native examples of native mosquitoes and there are some non-native mosquitoes. A lot of these non-native mosquitoes in the United States are certainly impacting us a lot, right? Because they are competing with a lot of our others and, and um, causing issues. Same thing with um, non-native bees or wasps that might come in as well. They often outcompete a lot of our native ones. And so I understand people's desires to kind of freak out a little bit <laughs> at the idea of tampering. At the same time, I also w- would hope um, that we can get to a point where people could also understand that there is a sense in which managing wildlife is important just because we have mangled it so much that things we could say aren't growing back the way that they should. And so again, I don't know as much about this particular issue with the mosquitoes uh, because that's a very layered, I've read like brief things about it, but I'm not a mosquito biologist. (laughs) And so I will concede to their expertise on this one, but I do understand again, it's, it's kind of two ways you can think of it. Philosophically, there's a sense in which even the mosquito has a place, right? Even a native mosquito, as annoying as it is, has a place. But what does that mean, right? Disturbances with habitat or thinking about its food sources or is it moving its range and how is it impacting people? And well, how can we help people if it is negatively impacting them? Again, goes back to that idea that I think we're starting to try to learn more about how to live with wildlife rather than just live separate from wildlife. And living with wildlife can sometimes be a little bit harder. It has a lot of more of those growing pains because something that used to just be out there that we didn't need to think about, (laughs) all of a sudden is impacting our daily lives. And so I think that's an example of one of those that kind of gets headlines, you know, that people get really freaked out about. But there's a lot of examples of different organisms that we're trying to think about, well, how do we live with this thing, (laughs) right? Um, Maybe it's an invasive um, that's here and we need to figure out maybe how to get rid of it if it's so detrimental. Maybe it's something that's just slowly started to colonize and kind of just exists with us, kind of like something like maybe a coyote or an armadillo. There's just a lot of data work, a lot of patience that needs to be had, and sometimes a little bit of creativity with hopefully the humbleness (laughs) to accept that some things can go awry. But at the same time, I do think it's important that people understand, you know, that we have to live with wildlife now. It comes down to like, you know, balancing different um, needs Mm -hmm. because you've got groups of people, you know, people just want to live their lives generally. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe, you know, they live in an area where crocodiles eat them, for example. In North (laughs) Queensland, that's something that actually is sometimes an issue. And yeah, so that there definitely does have to be changes in the way people approach and and live their lives if they're going to not just stamp out whatever species and ecosystems mm-hmm. exist. So that's um definitely a, a big problem. What what do you see as like the biggest threats to native ecosystems like forests or well i think and uh the sir david Attenborough uh, would also say that this is one of the largest threats to really our entire globe really is the loss of biodiversity um and so biodiversity implies biological diversity right the diversity of life uh the many different things the many different organisms living in one area that's including the plants um and the animals and the little microbes uh, and everything that lives in an area and you can kind of go micro to that. You can look at the biodiversity of a lichen specimen on a rock. You can look at the biodiversity of an entire ocean. And so it's really loss of biodiversity uh, that is really one of our greatest threats. And in fact, I would even uh, maybe be bold enough to say that biodiversity could not only be one of our greatest assets towards you know improving our way of life, but it might even be uh, one of the greatest assets in solving the carbon Uh, climate crisis that everyone is so worried about. But I think the answer really lies in biodiversity in that we have so many habitats that are able to cycle carbon through our environment. We have so many carbon sinks uh, through many of these vital habitats that are able to, again, cycle carbon through our system and be those carbon sinks that we need, whether we're talking about, especially about oceans and soil as two of our largest sinks. And so there's so many habitats that are just disappearing for a variety of reasons. Um, Obviously, farming and urbanization are two of the things that people think about. But even in little things like I've alluded to, the way that we farm, uh, the way that we landscape, the way that we 
uh, plan our cities and plan our green spaces, the way that we even preserve land, are we just keeping it as it is overgrown with non-native species and unable to actually allow wildlife to thrive? Um, because that's not helpful either. I think there's a lot of ways in which we're stamping out biodiversity that has great, great impact. Um, so even just landscaping, when we think about the types of shrubs and trees and, and flowers and things that we put around our house, uh, we could be creating a complete wall <laughs> that disallows native pollinators to want to exist. We could be um, putting in non-native plants that are just going to repel them. They're not going to use them. They're not going to utilize them. They're not going to live near them. They're not going to uh, pollinate them, right? They're very specialists, some of these insects um, that pollinate certain plants. And you get some of your best rewards when you're planting native plants. So that's just one example. And that could be just one house. You could save a whole colony <laughs> yeah. by just planting native plants. Um, and it also, of course, native plants are more resilient to your local habitat. So obviously, depends on where you are, but your native plants are going to be more likely to be well adapted to the soil environment, the climate environment that you're at. Um, also, the water uh, situation where you're at. That was uh, certainly one of the things I could talk about in my experiences being from the desert and seeing the types of landscaping that might occur there that wouldn't always make sense, right? So, so like so, the lawns again, and, and trying to like have that, you know, yeah. white picket fence, you, you have all this grass yeah. and it's like, it doesn't have like the roots. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's terrible yeah. for like water conservation. And there's just so many different ways that we, we stamp out biodiversity. And I think that's really where we need to take the next step in conservation. As I alluded to before, we did a great job of messaging Save the Trees. <laughs> But if you're just planting a bunch of trees in a row, that's just a monoculture farm. That's not a forest, you know, that's not going to sustain a, a diverse amount of life. That's not going to sustain, um, you know, generations and generations of, of, well, many of our animals, especially in the United States, uh, of what they need. And so there's really an essential need to go to that next step of, okay, we are consciously green. We want to be green. We want to be sustainable. Well, what does that mean? It means that sometimes... The habitat that we need might not be the habitat we thought we wanted. It might not have trees or the trees might be ugly, but uh, it's going to be long term more sustainable. Like, I mean, and that benefits, you know, our water, our soil, our air, um, our houses <laughs> and just the general quality of where we live. So for so people like, Ambrose, you know, back, yeah. <laughs> who, are, who are at home and wanting to help, you should maybe just be a little bit more thoughtful about which tree planting or planting organization you go to, one that focuses on rewilding and ecosystems yes. rather than just, you know, the whole sheer number of, of trees. Absolutely. Because like I said, in the United States, we used to have grasslands uh, in many places. We, we even have savannas in the United States, believe it or not. We have longleaf pine savannas, savannas that grow uh, within the specialized pine tree forests. Um, and people don't know it's in the backyard. And I wish I could just shout it from the rooftops and just show them pictures because it's beautiful. It's stunning. Maybe not in the winter, but it is beautiful and stunning the rest of the year. And so these are wonderful habitats that are just flat out disappearing. Um, it just in the wake of, of kind of reforesting and kind of more of a farm, <laughs> really, or again, in just decorative manners, just choosing trees to, to plant. Uh, decoratively. Uh, we have more trees now in the Northern Hemisphere than we did in the Industrial Revolution. So we've got a net gain, and yet we've still lost habitat. And so I think that should at least make us start to think about well, what's happening. Why is that equation? How can we have gained trees but still have, you know, uh, a climate crisis? Or how can we gain trees but still have issues with storing our carbon? And I think, again, biodiversity, and, and that's the other thing too, is biodiversity is not only kind of a, I guess we could say a health meter <laughs> for how an ecosystem is doing or how a habitat is doing, um, but it's really going to be indicative of really the long-term success of, of some of these habitats that we're trying to restore and conserve. So I think that's um, something to think about for people who are already in that process of maybe reworking their land. There's a lot of private landowners who are in these kinds of efforts trying to get their farms that maybe they got inherited to them, trying to figure out what to do with their property. Um, and there's lots of resources too. Um, I don't know about Australia, but certainly in the United States, there's even a lot of nonprofits that will just help you. Uh, just they'll, they'll help you, they'll provide you resources, help to bring you funding, bring you grants, help, help make management plans. If you really want to be green and sustainable, you want to restore your land so that it's native habitat, but you don't know where to start, people 
will help you. Um, and so I think that's just something to think about that it starts small. Again, a habitat, a biodiverse habitat could start with your landscaping. It could really start with your front yard, your backyard. Um, and, you know, that could start with maybe some birds and insects, and then it could spread out from there to, to the community and hopefully beyond. And that's kind of one of the issues with sustainability in general is that it's also interconnected. Um, are you familiar, I assume you are, with the sustainable development goals from the United Nations? Yes. Do you, do you think that they are sufficient or do you think that there needs to be more work on, like, obviously we're not even meeting those goals at the moment, but <laughs> do you think that those goals go far enough or do you think that we need to be more in depth? I think the next step is really just recognizing the specialized need for each type of habitat, um, that it isn't one size fit all. And so that's where, well, I, I respect policymakers and those who do come together to try to do these big things. A top down doesn't always work because what's going to be appropriate in your little slice of Australia is not going to be appropriate in my little slice of Georgia and the United States. Uh, and then even smaller to you know our specific ecosystems that we're a part of. So I think there's really a need for more, I guess, sustainable change, more long-term change when really communities get involved. And certainly policy is important. I think that can help with some of those larger issues, like, you know, if we're talking about poaching and illegal trading and those kinds yeah. of things are certainly out of our purview. Um, but I think sometimes, you know, when we're so focused on those large goals, it is hard to see where we can fit in as individuals. And it's like, well, how am I supposed to contribute to that? You know, I think a lot of people want to be involved, but if they, you know, <laughs> they might read, <laughs> they might read the report and go, well, well, what do I do? Like, that, that's so... It's, it's too it, big. It, it's, it's a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a lot. It's, it's kind of like, oh, those are really big things. And so I think that's where a lot of um, just small grassroots efforts really help with that. Being being aware, you know, where we live and what the needs are of our local habitats and ecosystems. Uh, being aware of different organizations that... Uh, can be mobilized to do immediate work in our communities. Uh, I think those kinds of things can help to, I guess we could say like vertical alignment, right? <laughs> to align us vertically towards those goals, because those are really what's going to actually get the boots on the ground work done. That's actually, um, I, I feel like I'm pimping here, but our organization, The Thrive Project, it was born out of a, a platform um, a software that is designed to take like a, a top-down approach, but contextually. So it can like take the raw data basically and bring it down to like the entity or the, the local level and figure out the best path forward from right down to an individual all the way up to like a global scale. So it's, it's very, yeah, context driven. Yeah. It, in that approach, you can have something that refines policy so much better than just having a global approach you can yeah you can really you know find that niche I suppose yeah. which is yeah. very important <laughs> behind policy you really need buy-in you really need people to believe that they're actually a part of that effort and that's where I think that really those human dimensions are becoming so vital um, because you could have amazing policies you could be doing the exact right thing that you need to do but if the people who are watching <laughs> don't know what that is or, or don't know what they're looking at, uh, you know, some of that could be for not. And so I think it's just as important to, again, synthesize that down um, to, yeah. really, to really bring that to a level that not only is a policy that can be enacted on on a smaller level, but also has a real presentation of like the benefits and, and how it's going to impact you and how you can impact it and that kind of participatory that's not just like here's a report you know here's what can be done but like well well how can you here's get involved how it and why you would you want to get involved yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's education surrounding it all is so important that's something that I, I definitely feel very strongly about because people yeah people either see the issues and they go it's too big it's out of my control or they don't understand all of the the contextual information and they don't get why things need to be done a certain way. So yeah, having that, having those conversations, I think is just really important for people um, in general. So I think we'll uh, wrap it up there, but thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been great talking with you and hopefully everyone listening will have uh, learned quite a lot 
and be more engaged in their local habitats and and um, restoring biodiversity. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.